Good evening everyone that's uh, watching this video. This is Joe Heflin. You can call me Joe or you can call me Brother Joe. It doesn't make any difference. Most people know who I am. I pastored a, what is called a message church, one that follows, followed the teachings of William Branham, one of the, some of the teachings of William Branham. Uh, there's many teachers and most churches take their pick on which teachings to follow, so you get many different variations of uh, what is truth, or what is called truth, not what is truth. I spoke the other day, I think the YouTube is up here on Be Not Deceived. We'll call this Be Not Deceived Part 2. It's really a continu continuation of the same message. And I'm not a, whatever you call it, not just lamb-blasting William Branham totally. Uh, I do disagree with him, as I disagree with many, many ministers out there teaching many things that I don't feel like have a scriptural foundation. Now, I may not give you quotes of William Branham as I speak today, but you'll recognize some of the teachings. Uh, I'll mention, you know, the foolish virgins, although I'm not going to read the scripture there. There is scriptures that calls a group foolish virgins. And also, if I spoke a little bit, I think, on sanctification, and uh, I might mention it again. But let's just start where, kind of where I left off. And let me say this. Uh, I think you heard uh, Brother Hall speak on one of the YouTubes here. He's had over 100 people check on it, and that's wonderful. I th he's a good friend of mine, real good friend. And I have two, two ministers, uh, One's in Michigan. His name is Ray Lanning. I have another one uh, down at Marble Hill, Missouri. His name is Tom Wall. And we, they're good friends, and uh, we're pretty much agreement on what's right and wrong about the message, best I know. But <clears throat> foolish virgins teach that uh, the foolish virgins are people that uh, were called sanctified people. They didn't really get right with the Lord, and they have to be I don't know, uh, suffer tribulation in, uh, uh, the tri in the tribulation period and to be uh, in order to be saved. First of all, there's no scripture for that. All it says about the foolish virgins in the scripture is that they'll be cast in outer darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I do not doubt that when... Judgment falls in this old world. There will be a lot of uh, crying and gnashing of teeth. But anyway, the Lord didn't know them. I believe that's what it says. They knocked on the door. It wasn't open. Uh, <clears throat> they were do doing part of the scriptures, maybe, or trying to be a part of the bridegroom. They didn't have any oil. I, I, I don't doubt that that is talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But let's go on and talk about the scripture, because I believe this... Uh, I don't believe there's any foolish person that's going to be saved uh, in tribulation because of what they partially believed. I'm going to talk about what I do believe. I, I do believe, uh, I'll quote Brother Hall and actually William Branham, when they asked about Calvinist or Armenian, he said, I'll stay with them as far as the battle goes, and I'll stay with any minister as long as you're in Scripture. I often send quotes out to the people that listen to me and uh, listen to our regular videos on, on Sunday and uh, every other Wednesday. And I often put quotes of uh, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Pink, uh, many different ministers out there. And you might say, do you think that they was right? No, not, not necessarily. I'm not trying to judge them. But what I put out that they say is correct. I could give you a quote from the latest uh, Pope of Rome. And I agree with the quote 100%. Not all of them, obviously. He didn't agree with Jesus, uh, the prayer that he told us to pray. They call it the Lord's Prayer. So I don't agree with that. But I, if I agree with a person, I'll agree with them. If I disagree, I try to base it upon Scripture. I notice the people that disagree with me that put comments out here, they never f fully justify it by Scriptures. Uh, 
they just kind of attack my personality, which I'm sure it needs attacked in occasionally. But this Saturday is five years since I stood in what we call a pulpit in the building at Cape Girada and told the building full of people that I would no longer be teaching the message of William Branham that I would be teaching scriptures, and I proceeded to tell them several things why. It caused a great forsaking of uh, listening to my teaching anyway. Well, we had a building full that day, about full, best I can remember. I don't know how many, I didn't count them. But today, if we gather there in the building, uh, we might have six or eight, and we do have up to 16 or 17 sometimes, depends on who comes and who don't. But let's, let's study the fact. I believe a person, let me make this plain, I believe they can have faith enough to be forgiven or maybe even justified. And I believe that they can be sanctified and then not saved. Now the reason why, because things are different now than when the church started. Now, I don't believe we live in a different age. But the way people are, and as many false doctrines and voices out there that's crying out different things, uh, people start out confused. Very few people I know started out in truth. In the days of the apostles, the Christians started out with truth. Uh, if in this day we had an apostle Peter or Paul or one of the apostles preached to us, then probably people would be justified, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost more quickly because there wasn't much error taught. There was questions. Those Jews on the law had questions they'd bring up and try to bring in their thoughts about it. But there was always someone there to correct it. But like Paul says there in Acts, uh, speaking, I think, to the Ephesus church, after my departure... Grievous woods will enter in. Well, that's happened. Uh, Paul told us in another place in Second Thessalonians, there will come a great falling away. I, I believe that's way past tense, way past tense. And I can speak of myself. I believe many churches preach enough about Christ for people to have faith and believe in Him for forgiveness. And I'm saying this on the Bible, on, on my own experience. I, from a child, I, I'm not raised in a religious home. I could tell a lot of stories. I, I was raised without elect electricity. Uh, a lot of things that I went through, but sure, I was a sharecropper's son. And we had a big spread, 20 acres, and half of that went to the boss. But we lived, and I'm thankful for it. But... <clears throat> I'd always had a thought about God. I used to climb up in a tree and you know, try to talk to him. But uh, really, I started out, uh, someone asked me, my mother did, if I'd like to go to a Baptist church that was offering to pick me up or have my dad take me by to Sunday school. And I wanted to go, and I did. I don't want to tell you my life story, but they never went. Uh, probably three, four times in my life, I can never remember being to any church with my parents. But that's side the point. When I got down in Corpus Christi, Texas as a young man, uh, <clears throat> 17 years old as a matter of fact, uh, I didn't serve the Lord too much, but I went back the second year. I was 18 going on 19, and I got under conviction. My brother had joined a Baptist church, so I started going to church with him. I got under conviction, and best I knew how to repent of what they was teaching, asking God to forgive me, I did that. I believe they taught enough faith for me to be forgiven, and I believe it was forgiven. Now, I'm not gonna go on with my life story what went on, but I'm 75 years old, so there's quite a lot of it has inspired, expired, or whatever you wanna call it, in my life. But let me go on. That I believe people can have faith, and it depends on what they do after that. Now, the devil is a roaring lion, especially in this day. If you're listening on the internet to my YouTube, there's probably 10,000 others out there that'll teach something different than what you're gonna hear today. How are you gonna know the difference? Well, 
you'll either seek the Lord and ask Him and pray and read your Bible and search it out, or else you'll just take somebody's word for it. And I, I always uh, admonish people not to take somebody's word, not mine. I search the Scriptures to see if the things I'm saying is true. Uh, Matthew, the 18th chapter, I've got verse 32 through 35. It starts before that. But you read about a man that owed a great debt. And I think they called him his Lord. Called him and uh, he begged for forgiveness. And, and the Lord forgave him. He was forgiven. There's no doubt about that. And But he went out and somebody owed him a little money. Not much, just a little. And he wouldn't forgive him. But anyway, the end of it was... The Lord called him back in and required all of his debts of him. And Jesus said this, Neither will your fa Heavenly Father forgive you your debts unless you forgive people. So we have a test starting out. Uh, I believe I was forgiven, but I believe many people can't, well, we usually have an old Southern saying, can't dish out, uh, can't take, can't take what's dished out. They can't take it back, in other words. And without a nature change, a born-again experience, which I mean justified, forgiven, sanctified, set apart for service, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I believe I can prove that with Scripture. But when you start by faith, Satan will start you out. He started me out in the Baptist church and a little Baptist doctrine here and there. I didn't know much about it. But I was a Baptist. But without any righteousness on me, I had a desire to find out more about it. So my next step was the Pentecostal church. Uh, <clears throat> so let's let's talk about something else here. I believe you can start out being saved by faith. And I, I hear a lot of preachers preaching, you can't be saved by works. Well, that's not scripture. Now let me explain that to you in two ways. First, you cannot be saved by works of the law. That is absolutely true, and that's Scripture. Let me read it to you. Romans 3.20 Therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be saved. Now, I don't have to read another. That's just it. But I can read Galatians 2 and 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come of the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words, the Scripture is telling us this. If there's any kind of life you can live, that is law that can save you, then Christ's work at Calvary, he died in vain. Uh, I couldn't teach a message to tell you how to be saved of works, but let me give you some scriptures because I believe some people are saved of works. We often hear the a rich man in hell preached about now, uh, you know, the rich man burned there in hell, and one Baptist minister, I'm a good friend of us, said the Pharaoh's in hell. He'd been screaming and burning and tortured in hell ever since Moses left Egypt. Uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, it just don't make sense to me. Now, people use, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Luke 16, where it is, the rich man went to hell and say that's, that means that's everybody. When you die, you go to hell or heaven. Well, if you take it literally what the Bible said, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. And I don't think I've never felt seen anybody that believed that every believer, maybe this is Old Testament, but even so, believed that everybody that died went to either Abraham's bosom or an eternal burning hell. Abraham was a type to show a comfort or torment. I've never understood how that uh, we all got eternal life according to a lot of teachings. Most denominations teach we all have eternal life when we're born. Did you know that? They teach you your soul's eternal. And then, uh, you know, they teach to have eternal life you got to accept Christ. And that's confusion to me. Uh, the wages of sin is death, and I'm not going to teach on hell, whether it's eternal or not today, but just going to mention, you know, if people is in a hell right now, burning and screaming and hollering, judgment day, they'll be brought out. And then they'll be judged and pitched in the lake of fire, it says. 
So it don't sound right to, to condemn, condemn a person, person to a torture for thousands and thousands of years before they're judged by their works. And that's what judgment is. It's judgment by your works. You know that. I believe you know that it's true. Uh, I believe that uh, the rich man might have some faith because he talked about Abraham, so he didn't teach it about it. He talked about Moses, the prophets. But he wanted Lazarus to go back because he said one raised from the dead. You don't speak to him, they'll believe. That's not true. Uh, it is true that one raised from the dead will speak to him, but it's not true they'll believe. Because every true ministry of God is Jesus Christ trying to speak to people. Uh, I could go on and talk about that, but here, you can read the Scriptures. Lazarus didn't go to Abraham's bosom because he believed and obeyed the law. It just said he was tormented or didn't have what he needed. The rich man didn't go to hell because he didn't believe. Abraham, Moses, the prophets said nothing about him believing or not believing. But he was in the place where he was, wherever you might believe it would be, simply because he did not do works. Now that's exactly right. Uh, he fared sumptuously every day. He had plenty. He paid no attention to a man at his doorstep. The dogs came and licked the sores. So he had no works to help him. Whatever faith he had didn't help either. So faith without works is dead. I agree that. That's what James said. So if you really have faith, you're going to do works. So he might have had a, an agreement, and he might have been very religious, but he had nothing to help him, no works. So faith will produce works. I, 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 I agree with that. And let's go to another scripture now if you have time. Matthew 25. And before we read it, verses 31 through 37, I want to give you a couple other scriptures. Or one scripture anyway. I, I give you one uh, over in Revelation where Christ comes back on a white horse and uh, you'll find 10,000 that are coming with him. And also Jude 1, I'm reading here, it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, convince all that are ungodly among them. But the point I'm making, when the Lord comes back, he's going to come with ten thousands of his saints. Now let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25 says this, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So, verse 32 says he's going to gather all nations. Now, I don't believe those that come with him. Jesus, I think, said that he believes on him, what the Father had said. I will never come to condemnation. That word in the Greek is, will never come to judgment. So God never judges anybody that is a real Christian by their works, but he will reward them for their works. There's a lot of difference there. They'll be rewarded for the works. You mean the man that had ten talents got rewarded, was given ten cities, another than five, five cities, if I remember right. The one didn't have any works, so he was taken away even that which he seemed to have. But he goes on to tell us in Matthew 25, and this is, to me, this is nothing to say these are foolish virgins. They're gathered all nations. Now that includes Israel, by the way, if it's all nations. And he'll separate them one from another as the shepherds divide his sheep from the goats. And I'm not going to read all of it, but to one group, he says this. He called them blessed. He told them to inherit the kingdom. Now we can understand we press our way into the kingdom now if you're a real Christian. We don't just inherit it at the end. And he, he gives them, he's, he, he talks about the works. He was hungered. And uh, you give me meat, thirsty. You give me drink, thirsty. You know, stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came into me. Then shall the righteous answer, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee or thirsty and give thee drink? Make this note. They weren't trying to be saved by what they did. They did it even not knowing what they did. This is my opinion, so it's not doctrine. I believe they did that to many people. 
I don't believe they just did it to Christians, but it was their nature to help people. I know some of the people they helped probably used it wrongly. I know, as I've said, I've, I've tried to help a person one time. I give him money to pay his car insurance, and he went and bought his kids some, kids some toys, a toy, with the money, a good expensive toy. Uh, and some people you can't help, I realize that. And that don't, that don't count. The works you do for drunkards that buy more beer or uh, people out there that uh, take your food and your money and go out and use it unwisely, make their kids suffer and spend it for dope or cigarettes or booze or whatever they want to spend. I don't believe they, you get a reward for doing that. But you remember Paul, when, it, when Jesus confronted me there, he said, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? So the way you treat a Christian is the same as treating Christ. There's no question about that. And these people had treated Christ correctly. They, they, they'd fed him. They'd give him something to eat. They'd give him groceries. Uh, they'd give him something to drink. Uh, they'd tuck him in when he didn't have a place to live. And they didn't know they'd done it, but Jesus knew they'd done it. And what was happening? They were being judged, not by their faith, it's not even a mansion, but by their works. I do believe this, I'll make it plain. I don't have time to go all the scriptures today. I don't want to take too much time. I'm not really sure how long I've been going. Uh, excuse me while I look here, try to figure it out. Not too long, about 21 minutes. I'll go a little bit longer, uh, if I could. Uh, there are churches that believe, you know, they're just saved. They just, well, I just believe Jesus Christ, and the, and the church will tell them they're saved, and they'll spend their life in the church, never hear anything else. But if a person ever is confronted with the words of Jesus Christ, he'll be judged by those words. I believe people sit in churches and, and warn us preachers that don't study and pray and seek out the truth. Uh, someone gave me a quote from, I think it was Mr. Pink the other day. As a matter of fact, about nine pages. Uh, I read those nine pages and I agree with it 100%. 100%. Then Mr. Pink went on to say that, you know, you had to keep the Sabbath, only he called it Sunday instead of rightfully, uh, should have called it Saturday. And he also said that if you don't believe in a triune God, you can't be a Christian. Well, I just disagree with Mr. Pink. Uh, I don't know how he ended up, but we'll leave that alone. That's because that's up to God. A man told me one time after he preached his funeral when he died, he still hadn't died, by the way, but he said, don't put me in heaven or hell, Brother Joe. Just, just, just preach. And that's all I ever do. I never put a person in heaven or hell. That's up to God. He knows the heart. I, I sometimes just hid from me what people really are. I've listened to ministers and followed ministers and come find out they was uh, adulterers and uh, even your pedophiles and everything else out there. So you got to be careful. Those people will be judged according to their works. Foolish virgins, I don't say that at all. See, don't say that at all. So we've already talked about this and Jesus told us this. If you find someone that believes in him and give him a drink of water, even in the name of a disciple, that would be yourself, your disciple, whatever, or whoever you are, or, or in the name of a Christian. If they're a Christian, you give them a drink, you'll not lose your reward. Something will come out of it. Someone said, well, that'll all be in this life. Well, I don't know that. I just don't know that. Paul talks about a man, 2 Timothy 1, 14 through 18. I probably can't pronounce his name correctly, Paul talks about all in Asia being turned from him. You know, I know there's not many people listen to me or follow me anymore. Like I said, we once had a church full. Now, when I meet in the building in the Cape, and I say that because I only meet every other week. And right now, I'm not meeting at all because our, our building has had some destruction and having to be repaired. And we may not be back in Cape till September. I don't know exactly when or even then. Uh, they're doing the best they can to repair it. So we're just waiting on that. But here's the thing about it. building don't matter. I've tried to quit calling them building churches because they're not. They're buildings. If you're a believer, you're the church. 
So let me go on now. Second Timothy talks about all, all he mentions uh, Hermogenes, if I'm saying that right, Phagelius. But anyway, he mentions one man and he mentions his name, and I probably can't pronounce it either, but it's something like Anisophorus. And here's why he mentioned him. Not because he was a great believer and had faith, but he mentioned him because he refreshed Paul. And he was not ashamed of Paul, he was ashamed. He sought him out very delicately. Now he's talking about everybody forsaking him, but this man hunted him up and helped him out. And in verse 18 it said, The Lord grant mercy, excuse me, let me say, grant to him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered to me. Now, he was ministering into Jesus Christ. Nobody could have doubted that because Paul was certainly had Christ in him. Now, he was talking about give, being given mercy on that day. What day? Well, he's not talking about now because if he's a Christian, he's received mercy now. Second Corinthians four one says, "We have this ministry; we have received mercy. We faint, faint not." Second First Peter two, excuse me, ten. Time past were not a people, but now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now, now, present tense, have obtained mercy. Every Christian obtains mercy, present tense. Paul was praying for him to receive mercy in that day. He was not convinced. Perhaps Paul didn't preach to him the gospel. I don't know. I don't believe he turned the gospel down. Uh, you can't turn it down. I don't believe and come out good on Judgment Day. I'd sure hate to, that's for sure. But if you hadn't heard the gospel. I had a neighbor where I used to live. He was a Catholic. No, excuse me, he was not. He was a charismatic. And I had a couple of people that were Catholics. Uh, this charismatic man looks to help people. If he see me working in a yard and having a little trouble lifting, moving, doing something, he was a farmer. It don't matter if he's heading to the field or... How far behind he was, he'd pull that tractor over and run out in the yard and help me. He'd come up and sit and talk to me. If he thought there was anything he'd do to help me, he was there. Not only me, but anybody else. I've seen him help other neighbors or widow women, need your yard cutting, need their lawnmower fixed. He was there to work on him. He has a good nature, easy to talk to. And I've had, I think I've mentioned this before, but I've had people call themselves message believers, uh, sit in the shade, and enjoy a glass of tea or lemonade or something while I was sweating trying to work. And they'd holler and say, now don't get too hot, Brother Joe. One day I, I'd hurt myself, my shoulder pretty bad, and I was trying to load a wagon load of wood. I burnt wood. A couple of Catholic boys come by and got off what they was doing and load that whole load for me. And shook my hand, was glad they could do it. Well, I'm, I'm just saying, if you do good works to a Christian... God knows that. And He's not a mean God that puts everybody down and kind of laughs while they burn. I, I don't believe that. I believe He's a merciful God. And maybe another message I'll teach on what the Bible really teaches about hell and the grave and Hades and these different things, but not now. Another thing I'd like to mention quickly, the book of life. Somebody said, well, my bunions on the book of life. It may be. If it was, it's before the foundation world. But you know, the Bible does say something that I don't hear said very often, especially in the message. It's found in Revelation 3 and 5 for, uh, well, let's read Exodus 32 first. Moses was trying to, I believe, find mercy for Israel. And, it, and he told God, blot my name out of the book you've written. And God said, whoever sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now, how could he blot them out if it wasn't there? Exodus 32. Revelation 3. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. You've got to overcome to get that white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I'll confess his name before my father, before his angels. Not blot. So if you can't blot it, why would not blot be in there? In Revelation 20, that warning, which many, many persons, including myself in time past, as I said, by God's grace, I've tried to repent and confess and 
not justify anything I've ever done. But it says if you take away from the words of this book, God will take away his part out of the book of life. <coughs> and out of the holy city and from the things that were written in this book. If his name wasn't in the book of life, how could he take it out? <coughs> Let's go back to the deceiving part. A person full of the Holy Ghost will never be permanently deceived. Because Jesus said they could not. The elect cannot be deceived. Now all of us start out in deception. I could give you many scriptures that Paul said we were once deceived. But one day the Holy Ghost will open our eyes. Religion will never save you. It just can't do it. God will forgive some, but their nature will not forgive. So this won't be accounted to them. Until you have the Holy Ghost, and because the Holy Ghost is given to those that believe and obey His Word. So if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you must not obey His Word. Uh, how long does it take me to get it? Well, you have to put your faith in what the Bible says, that's for sure. Uh, you can't believe you're sanctified by the way you dress. I mentioned before, but Jesus mentioned gifts and gold. And He asked this question, the gold. Now this gold, gold could be used to coat an idol. They would, uh, uh, some people allot it to a Christmas tree in Jeremiah 10 if you'd like to read it, but you cut the tree down out of the woods, bring it in, decorate it with, I believe it says silver and gold. But they'd make an idol and they'd coat it with gold. Well that same gold was brought into the temple. Wasn't no difference in it and in the gold that decorated that idol. But when they put it on the altar, God said that altar, Jesus said, that altar sanctifies the gold. So, like I said, I saw an Amish man today, a fine fellow, he spoke to me and I greeted him. And they're quite plentiful around where I live. But when I see them, they're, they're dressed like holiness, Pentecost. But I don't think, well, there's a real Christian. He may be. Or he may be a Christian. He may be one of God's children that will come out one of these days. But I think of an Amish, a Mennonite, or a Pentecostal. And there is a group of Baptists that call themselves holiness. All the women wear the dress clear down to the ankles. Absolutely. No makeup. Don't cut their hair. But they call themselves Baptists. Uh... I don't look at them as judge them as Christians or not. But the way you dress don't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian and sanctifies you is the faith you have in the blood of Jesus Christ. I can take you over to Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10 and read that to you, but you can read it. It's just Scripture. You're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. not anything you can do. There's only one Scripture in the Bible that talks about sanctifying anything you could do and that has been sanctified from fornication, whichever Christian will. No question about that. But a person can be sanctified and fall. Now Hebrews 10 tells us that. How much sore punishment suppose you shall be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant, wherein he was sanctified. So he was sanctified, absolutely. But he counts it an unholy thing. See, they, they may not count the blood to sanctify them. They may think their dress makes them holy or their clothes or not wearing jewelry. Uh, I'm not against any way a woman wants to dress. I've mentioned that before. Uh, a dress down her knees or even down the floor. They call them Mike's dress. That's fine. If she don't want to cut her hair, amen. I, I love women with long hair, not wearing makeup. Glory to God. Thank God for you. But you do all that, you're still not sanctified. No. And I know many women that dress like that. I, I assure you, best I can reason, the way they talk and act, they're not sanctified because they don't believe the Scripture. If you believe the blood of Jesus Christ, then you'll get sanctified because He'll sanctify you and set you apart. When God calls you and sets you apart as a special person, the elect, part of His bride, He has predestinated. I can use that word, I believe. Then you're sanctified then, and He'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. Now, Cornelius got it real quick. Peter preached maybe 20 minutes. Cornelius got justified, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And he was elected and will never, never fall into error. He started out with something that wasn't error. 
Like I said, sometimes before God can fill us with the Holy Ghost, He has to cleanse up all the false doctrine we've been taught. Well, anyway, Hebrews 10 said, Did you actually live by faith? Faith in the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive me and justify me, take away things, to become my atonement. Faith in Jesus Christ to be sanctify me and set me apart for His own use. Faith in Jesus Christ to keep His promise and fill me with the Holy Ghost. That's all just by faith, see? Justification, sanctification, all sorts of receive eternal life must come through the Holy Ghost. When you receive the Holy Ghost, the Word given is what you receive and you heard. But we can choke it out. Uh, the devil can take it out of your heart. Uh, it may not have depth of heart. But if it's ever quickened, that means made alive by the Holy Ghost, brother. You're in good shape then. That is eternal life. Thank you for listening to me today. I appreciate it. Pray for me. If you want to do something for me, pray for me. You know, we've we've had a church full of people, like I said. Now we're down to eight or ten, maybe five people that support the church. And that's fine. We'll make it. But just pray for me because prayer is what's needed. Paul prayed for the saints daily. If you take me to be right in any way, pray for me. If you think I'm teaching something wrong, give me scripture and give me an email. Help me talk to you. I'm going to be right. And I will receive correction if it's scriptural correction. But not just some guy out in Arizona and said, you know, the serpent's blind as your eyes, buddy. Well... The serpent blinded a lot of people's eyes, but I pray that God has opened mine. So may the Lord bless you. I hope this will help you. Any questions you have or want to email me, uh, uh, I think it's Truth316, Truth, spell out the word 3, T-H-R-E-E, -E, and then put in 1 and 6, at outlock.com. I usually put it up there, but today I did So bless you. Lord keep you. I have to turn my head a little bit to turn this off, but we'll uh, we'll be praying for people that's hearing the word. God bless you.